All right, so I don't have a specific place I'm going to have you turn in your Bible uh, tonight just yet. Um, as strange as it sounds, we're not going to use a lot of Bible. We're, we're going to do a quick review of two weeks ago. Obviously, last week, July 4th, I was in Cambodia, uh, and so we skipped that. We're diving back in tonight. And once again, the whole idea of Corey Coffee and conspiracy. Now, when you hear conspiracy, people think, oh, you're one of those conspiracy theorists. Oh, you're one of those nuts, which is interesting because as Bible believers, we teach one world government, one world religion, one world currency. You, you go down the list, one world dictator. Okay, well, how, how are you going to get 7 billion people on this planet to buy in to a one world system without a conspiracy? I mean, you just think it's just going to miraculously show up, right? Okay, and here's what's really interesting. We would all agree that we believe God is working all things together for his plan. And so we look around and we go, man, the rapture's got to be near. And man, isn't it crazy how Israel became a nation? And, and we talk about all this stuff and we say, yeah, God's working his plan. As though the God of this world isn't working his plan. As though Satan is just in a timeout waiting for this seven years he's going to be given. Which is why we come to this verse. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now, he even tells you, God's letting you know that Satan is the God of this world. We read in Ephesians where he is the prince and power, prince and power principality and power, there we go, of this world. He said in, in Ephesians 2.2 2, that before you got saved, that you were controlled by that system, and you did what that system was designed for you to do. Here's what's even more interesting. Jesus is 40 days and 40 nights. He's out there, right? And, and all of a sudden, Satan comes up and tempts him, right? What does he do? Takes him up on a high mountain and offers him all the kingdoms of the world. If he would just bow down. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus didn't say, what do you mean, offer me all the kingdoms? You don't own them anyway. That's not what he said. He, he quoted the word back to him. But at the end of the day, he didn't rebuke him for saying, hey, I'll give you these kingdoms. All right. So what we've been doing over the last few weeks and a few more weeks to come is we've been taking 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And what we're doing is showing you that the conspiracy is all connected. And, we, you know, if we're talking about the Nephilim, the Giants, the Jesuits, Hollywood, which I think I'm going to go there next week, Bilderberg, the Vatican, the Pope, Freemasonry, we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight the knights of malta jpl babylon workings we're going to definitely talk about that that's a freaky deal uh hellfire club we'll mention tonight uh trilateral Con commission council on foreign relations transhumanism which we've discussed some we will come back to mk ultra the federal reserve the guys that own your money the government doesn't own it they do they are the central bank uh, d wave computers the illuminati skull and bones, CERN, Antarctica, and the megaliths and monoliths of all throughout the world. We'll discuss all those as we go. However, what we're trying to show you is there is one central being involved in all that. And all of that is working together. Now, we would all stand up and say Romans 8, 28, right? All things are working together for our good and for the purpose of God. Okay, great. Do you not think the system on the other side is doing the same thing? Okay, so when I stand up and go, yeah, I'm a conspiracy guy. Oh, you're a nut. No, I'm a Bible believer, which to the world, you're a nut, all right? And by the way, when you look up peculiar people, that's what that is. In modern English, you should be a nut job to the rest of the world, all right? So... Last week, I'm going to tie this in. I'm going to show you a quick review. We're trying not to do reviews in here because we don't only we only have an hour. And so I'm wanting to do this. But remember, no matter where you go, in the Vatican, you have the pregnant dome of Isis in the back and the phallus up in front. All right? You have the pregnant dome in the back. You have the phallus up in front. Okay? You have the Pantheon, which is the building here, phallus in the front, pregnant dome in the back. 
And the most famous place on the planet is Washington, D.C. with the pregnant Dome of Isis and the Washington Monument, the obelisk, the charged phallus that we talked about uh, last two weeks ago. Now, with that being said, if you don't understand what I just described, what is going on here? All right. Let's go. All right. So. There we go. All right. So we talked about this city and its layout and how that right down here at the Capitol, why he's being inaugurated in as the president right in front of the phallus, right to the left uh, to the right of that going straight north is the building where the 33rd degree, ma degree Masons right at the same time as the inauguration, they're in their summonsing the spirit of Apollo. Okay. The spirit of Osiris and they believe that he's coming back and they want them to inhabit the man being inaugurated which means there is a chance that the Antichrist could be an American president you say no 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 he's got to be a Jew he's got to be an Assyrian yeah you're right but why does that mean he can't be a president Okay, we'll come back to that. We talked about the apotheosis of George Washington where he's being deified, which is what the word apotheosis means, to become a god. Okay, we talked about the, how the dome was laid out. Right below is the rotunda, the crypt, and the Washington uh, tomb that he was never buried in, and it was all laid out for that. And you can go back and study all that. We talked about the city laid out in a pentagram, and we talked about the owl uh, and the design there, and the owl. Isle of Molech. We talked about the Bohemian Grove, and we talked about the symbolism that was in Washington. Even the even the Mason symbol that you see laid out coming to to the uh, Jefferson Memorial, the White House coming together here, guys. It, it, you can't find this in Atlanta. Pull out your Google map and look all through there, okay? Uh, we did the same thing. There was an unfinished pyramid, and at the top was the temple of the 33rd degree Masons with an unfinished uh, pyramid on top of it. We talked about the dollar bill and all the meanings that were behind that. And notice, we didn't talk a lot about it last week, but notice it says, in God we trust. Now, what God? Do you honestly believe that the designers of all this with the all C and I are talking about the same God that you and I talk about? And guys, by the way, when public people stand up and talk about God, what does that mean? Now, here's, I'll bring that out in a minute. And we talked about the eagle and its connection to Horus. You can go back and look at all this. We talked about Revelation. Uh, and we said, at the end of the day, there are three states of evil. The Vatican Rome, which is the controlling religious city. Then we saw the city of London, which was the controlling financial city. And then we talked about Washington, D.C., which is the controlling military city. And that we believe that the conspirators who are globally controlling this planet use all three of those cities to do what they want to do. And you've got to, you've got to remember, the Antichrist is going to come in and put in a one-world financial system, a one-world religious system, and a one-world military system. So why would it be far-fetched to believe that they're already working towards that? So... I'm going to bring you out a couple quick symbols. I just want to kind of throw these out here so you can check them out. And then we're going to get into our founding fathers. Now, this is obviously the aprons of the Masons. And, and, and different levels have different types of Masons. But notice the two pillars. Notice the checkered floor. T's wearing, where's T? Is she in here? She's in overflow. Oh, there you are. She's got the Mason shoes on tonight. Uh, I guess helping us out. But notice this apron. I was at a funeral at my last church uh, where an older gentleman died who was a mason and this is what they were wearing at the funeral now check this out look at this it's called the royal arch apron where have you seen that before now understand before you here's what happens i study for two years on this stuff you listen for 30 seconds and you go <laughs> Not ever actually studying into it to find out what you're being told is true or not. And so the bottom line is this. 
symbolism means everything to the mason. You need to understand that symbolism is huge. Why do you think that city is laid out in symbolism? And symbols are everywhere. They're subliminally telling a message. Have you ever seen that? Yes. Well, you have because I showed it to you. <laughs> there you go. Now, what's interesting is your Gmail looks identical. Now, out of all the logos that they could have done to have Gmail, why make it look like that? You know what that means? It means if you, if you have Gmail, you have the mark of the beast. <laughs> I'm just mad. <laughs> you got to have a little fun doing this. <laughs> no, no. But guys, isn't it interesting? That and that, you see that every day and never make a connection. Oh, by the way, look at it very carefully in 3D form. There is another symbol in your Gmail. That's a pyramid. And the reason we know it's more than just three lines is you got the shadow on this side as though the light is coming from this side, creating the shadow. Do you honestly think that was just some guy come up with, oh, well, my boss told me to come up with a mail logo today, and so here's what he came out with. All right, so we all know this, right? The mason symbol, the big uh, compass and square, kind of looks like your apple store. You know, and somebody would say, oh, wait a minute, it's, it's, it's a little different. Now, hang on. Just in case, here's the Apple one, but you say, well, I don't use Apple. Well, here's the Android one. All right, now, hang with me. Now, some of you right now are going, wait a minute, we don't even use the Android. We're, we're a Google Play, okay? Hang with me. You go to the Google store? Right. Now, check this symbol out. Okay, this is called the, the, it's, it's called the seal of Satan or the sigil of, of Lucifer. Okay, and I want you to notice it was used by Anton or it's promoted by Anton LaVey, but it goes back to the 1400s and it's all about Satanism. You ever notice that? Here is your Google Play logo. Here is the seal of Satan. You're probably right, though. I'm probably reading into it, all this. <laughs> Google, Apple, Android, Facebook. Hang on. Tubal Cain. This is a symbol for the Masonic Tubal Cain. And we'll come back and hopefully cover him eventually. But notice that. Looks a lot like that. Got the round circle. Got the little case F to make it look just like it. But you're probably right. I set up, well, since I got back from Cambodia, I wake up at 1130 at night and I'm up all night long. And so I guess a lot of coffee and a lot of stretching of the mind, I was able to make all that work. All right, now let's get to the founding fathers. Or let's talk about the faith of the founding fathers. Or as my good friend Tony, Alley, uh, Tony Godfrey says, the lack of faith of our founding fathers. Uh, now hang with me. Let me give you a couple of prefaces just so you don't get fired up with me. I love America. I don't want to live anywhere else. I just got back Saturday and one of the, every time I go out of this country and I land and I come back, I'm thinking the greatest place on this planet, I just landed in it. I love this country, and is it is Christianity the predominant religion? Absolutely. Nobody would deny that. But you've been taught since you were a kid that the founding fathers were Christians. You were taught that they were very dedicated to Christianity and Jesus Christ. Okay, well, what I want to do tonight is take what they say, not what you th say they say, not what I say they say. Let's just take their letters, their writings, and break it down. And if you are a Bible believer, I want you to take what they say and compare it to the way you feel about God, Jesus Christ, and the Word of God. Okay? Now hang with me here. 
So the founding fathers, right? We talk about all these guys. So if you're going to understand the American Revolution, if you're going to understand the founding fathers, if you're going to understand the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, you've got to understand the day or the age in which this country was birthed. Number one, it was the age of enlightenment. You go back and study. It's called the Age of Enlightenment. It's all throughout Europe at that time. The Age of Enlightenment, sometimes called the Age of Reason. And it was all about reasoning things out, right? Here's the big problem with that. Does Christian faith come with reason? It's a faith. Now think about this. Reasoning. Why would God... Come to this earth, become a man, be spit upon and be beat upon so that you, 2,000 years later, can receive him as Savior. Does that make sense? No. That goes against reasoning. And oh, by the way, I don't know how you had, had it go down. I knelt down in an altar and called out to a God I could not see, Amen. trusted in a God who I've never met in person, it goes against all reasoning. Do you know what my favorite verse is in the Old Testament? I quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm not to trust into my own understanding, my own reasoning, my own thought. I'm to fully trust into Him. Okay? Now, hang with me. So, this, this age of reason refers to the time of guiding intellectual movements called the Enlightenment. It covered about a century and a half in Europe, beginning with the publication of Francis Bacon's book. That's here. Notice the two columns. I mentioned it with her shoes in that floor. Okay? Now, he writes this book, Nova... Uh, Orgum, right, in 1620. And I already told you, Francis Bacon wrote the New Atlantis. If you really want to understand our founding fathers, you need to understand Francis Bacon because that's who influenced them. And he was influenced by John D., a witch, but we'll come back to that later. All right? In general terms, the Enlightenment was an intellectual movement. Okay, developed mainly in France, Britain, and Germany, which advocated freedom, democracy, and reason as the primary values of society. So in order to understand the thinking behind the American Revolution, you need to understand their mindset. Now, here's where it's all going to start with. A man named Thomas Paine. Now, if George Washington was the bronze of the American Revolution, this was the brains. Thomas Paine. He writes a book called Common Sense. It's produced by a printer. Do you know who that printer was? Benjamin Franklin. He, he gets him to write it, and originally he doesn't sign it. He, does, he, he writes it anonymously. But Common Sense is a book that is written on the thought of the age of reason or enlightenment. And when Thomas Paine writes it, it influences a man named Thomas Jefferson greatly. And Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence based upon the writings of this book, Common Sense. Now, we hold these truths to be self-evident. What do you call that? That's called reasoning. Now, is salvation self-evident? No, it's a faith. You mean to tell me the virgin birth is self-evident? How do you believe? I mean, come on. Let's think about this. Doesn't the virgin birth go against reasoning? There is not one guy in this room, if you got engaged and your new wife says, hey, or, you're not even married yet. You're you know, three or four months away. And she says, hey, I'm pregnant. But don't worry. I'm still a virgin. Not one guy would go, okay, that makes sense. That sounds about right. It goes against reasoning. But remember, everything we build our belief system on is built upon faith, not reasoning. The, the most unrealistic thing on this planet is that a holy God would want to have a relationship with you as a sinner. 
There is nothing reasonable about that. Okay, now hang with me. Thomas Paine. Let's get to him. Now, here is what's written on his gravestone. It says, on this site buried Thomas Paine, and he says, the author of Common Sense, the pamphlet that stirred the American colonies to independence. John Adams said, without the pen of Paine, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. History is to ascribe the ever a revolution to Thomas Paine. You know what he's literally saying? If you want, we always attribute the revolution to George Washington, and rightfully so. But what they're telling you is if you really want to know the power behind it, it's pain. Okay? So if you and I are going to study our fathers, our founding fathers, and what makes this country and how awesome it works and how great it, it is as a nation and why we have what we have compared to the rest of the world, it has to start with this man. Okay? Now, he, Thomas Jefferson's writing of the, uh, of the Declaration of Independence is based off of this book called Common Sense. All right, Paine's ha had these pamphlets called the American Crisis Pamphlets, and they were read before the soldiers, before war, as like a pep rally before the big game. So, you know, you're, you're gathered around the campfire and they're reading Thomas Paine's book and it's firing guys up. So he must be a solid man of faith, right? After all, we're a Christian nation. Hang with me. All right. Here's what Thomas Paine says about Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, guys, when Jesus is out there and he sends his crew out and they go around talking about him and then they meet back uh, there next to Pan's, Pan the goat god's cave is actually where they had gathered around in Matthew 16. And he said, who do men say that I am? Well, some say this, some say that. And then he asked the most important question ever. Who do you say that I am? Because all of our belief system comes down to your belief in Jesus Christ and who he is. Because if you tell me he's a great moral teacher, I'm sorry, you don't get it. The Muslims believe in him as a prophet. That doesn't mean they're saved. A lot of people have looked and said, I love the teachings of Jesus. That's not what we're about, guys. I love Jesus, not just his teachings. I believe he was God in human flesh, and I believe he died for me, gave his life for me, and now I have a personal relationship with him. And what you say about Jesus will determine everything else about you. Now, watch this. It is the fable of Jesus Christ as told in the New Testament and the wild and visionary doctrine raised thereon against which I contend. The story, taking it as it is told, is blasphemy and obscene. Now you may have a different belief system on what you consider a good Christian person than I do, but the, he ain't even close. And by the way, what he's talking about being blasphemous and obscene is the virgin birth. Okay, he says this, Christian, the Christian religion and masonry, talking about the Freemasons, have one and the same common origin. Both are derived from the worship of the sun. The difference between their origin is that the Christian religion is a parody of the worship of the sun in which they put a man of whom they call Christ in the place of the sun and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the sun. And oh, by the way, if you investigate the Catholic Church, he's dead on the money. I would contend with Thomas Paine, I'm not a part of that. I am a Bible-believing lover of Christ, and I've never looked at the sun one time and worshipped him or that through it. All right? Now, had the news of salvation of Jesus Christ been ascribed on the face of the sun and the moon in the characters that all nations would have understood it, the whole earth had known it in 24 hours. In other words, he's saying, man, if we'd have just stuck the story of Christ on the moon and on the sun in all kinds of languages, everybody on the planet would have known it within 24 hours, right? Okay, I understand. 
Now, he says, and they would have believed it. Whereas, though, it is now almost 2,000 years since, as they tell us, Christ came upon earth, not a 20th part of the people, uh, he's basically saying not 20% of the population even knows who he is. And he says, and among those who do, the wiser part do not believe it. So in other words, you poor, dumb Christian. That's what he just said. Now, whenever we read the obscene stories and the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel, torturous executions, the unrelenting vindica vindicativeness which, with which one, which with which more than half of the Bible is filled, it would be more consent that we call it the word of a demon rather than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that as served to corrupt and brutalize mankind and for my part I sincerely detest it as I detest all that is cruel. So the Bible that sits on your front of you right now, he's saying it'd been better off call that the word of a demon than the word of God. And remember, this man is the brainchild behind the Declaration of the Independence. This guy is the brainchild behind the pamphlets that charge the men up to go fight for freedom. Now, any pastor or priest willing to preach the heresy of Jesus Christ as the Son of God should be ashamed of himself. Guilty. Absolutely without any shame, I preach him as the Son of God. Now, let's talk about Thomas Jefferson. Because most people are probably sitting around going, hold up, I ain't even heard of Thomas Paine, and now you're starting with that guy? Okay, that's cool. Let's talk, let's talk about Thomas Jefferson, who was greatly influenced by Thomas Paine. Who, they were friends, and as I told you before, the Declaration of Independence was based upon this guy, Thomas Paine. Now, here's what's interesting. How many times does the Declaration of Independence mention the person of Jesus Christ? Do you know what they call God? Creator. Now, to the Muslim, who, that, who is that? Allah, right? Okay. To the, to the Hindu, to the Buddhist, to the Christian, to the Catholic. Okay. Creator covers it all. To the Mason, the great architect. Okay. So understand, if these men were so devout... Pick up the bylaws of Kelly Harbin. All of you should have a copy. If you don't, we'll get them to you. <laughs> Count how many times we mention Jesus Christ. Because our whole system of belief is not about God. It's about Jesus. Matter of fact, the God, Jehovah God, has so cho chosen to reveal himself through the person of Jesus Christ. And so each and every week when we get up, we sing about the person of Jesus Christ. And so if these guys were so driven to be Christians and great men of faith, why not mention Christ? Well, and I know somebody's going to say, well, they're all about the freedom of religion. Okay, we, we can have a discussion there. But you're telling me these are great men of faith and they don't even mention Christ. Who do men say that I am? Remember the great question? So let's talk with Thomas Jefferson, right? Here's what he says when it comes... Now, and by the way, every one of these things that I'm going to quote are, is not some book. This is literally, this is what I've done for the last two nights, going and copy and pasting from the National Archives, and literally you can go on and find each one of these letters that they're writing. So this is not somebody's belief system. Like, do you guys know David Barton, wall builders? Okay, David Barton wrote a book about Thomas Jefferson trying to prove that he's a Christian, and Thomas Nelson, the publisher, had to actually pull it off the shelf. Because he misrepresented Thomas Jefferson as a Christian. And anybody that is a first-year college student taking American history and psychology class or philosophy could, could have debunked that book. Now, as a born-again evangelical Christian, I wish the book were true. 
it would be much easier to defend. The problem is he's just telling lies. You cannot prove that Thomas Jefferson is a born again Bible believer. Hang with me. You say, well, he's even got his own Bible. We'll get to his Bible. (laughs) Here's, Here's what he's talking about in Revelation. It's been 50 or 60 years since I read it. And I then considered it merely the ravings of a maniac. No more worthy nor capable of explanation than the incoherence of our own nightly dreams. You know the book about the return of Christ that we're all fired up about? That's what he believes about it. But of the greatest of all the reformers of the depraved religion of his own country was Jesus of Nazareth. So he's going to brag on Jesus a little bit. But notice what he calls him, Jesus of Nazareth. You know why we don't call him that? He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. That would happen to be a physical place he lived. Hang with me. Abstracting what is really his from the rubbish is which is it is buried is easily distinguished by the luster from the dross of the biographers as separable from that as the diamond from the dunghill. We have the outline of the system of the most sublime moral morality which has ever fallen from the lips of man outlines outlines which is lamentable he did not live to fill up okay let me put that to you in basic terms we have these great teachings of all the morality of a man named jesus of nazareth that is wrapped around all the depravity and garbage and dunghill written by the other guys now i don't know how you see the bible what Paul says in Corinthians is just as much the Word of God as what Jesus said in the Gospels. One doesn't rank higher than the other. It's God's Word. Genesis to Revelation. He said, no, 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 no. All that other garbage that Peter and John, all his, all his disciples, all they've done is dragged his thing down. Now, hang with me. We got, here. he's going to talk about the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, that's important. We got the Supreme Court. We got the Ten Commandments on the door up there. Well, he must have been a Christian believing in the Ten Commandments. Hang with me. We got, we, where, where got we the Ten Commandments? He's asking a question. The book indeed gives us to us verbatim, but where did it get them? In other words, we can get it out of the Bible, but where did the Bible get them? And he goes on. He says, for it tells us that they were written by the finger of God the table uh, on the tables of stone, which were destroyed by Moses. It's specifically those of the second set of tables in different forms of substance, but still without saying how that the others were recovered. But the whole history of these books is so defective and doubtful that it seems vain to even attempt a minute inquiring into it. Now, does that sound like a Bible-believing Christian? I don't know what kind of Christian that is, but it's not a Bible-believer. Now, I could have summed it up for him. Where did Moses get it? God. It's God's Word. But if you live in the age of reasoning, does that make sense? Have you ever seen God write on a stone with His finger? I haven't. So since I can't prove it, and it doesn't make sense, I have to go against it. We believe these truths to be self-evident. We can prove it. All right? Now, in the New Testament, so 